What is up everybody, Mr. Purtis here. Welcome to the second video on how to DBQ. This one is focused specifically on one point on the rubric, but I find that most people have the biggest difficulty or challenge with this one. So I want to kind of make it its own separate thing. So this is on document analysis. So it's analyzing the document, specifically the source of the document and the impact on the message. So I call, I'm going to call this from here on out hip. Um, other teachers call it hippo, hippie, soap, soapstone. There's all kinds of different things that people use for this. Uh, the new one kind of over the past couple of years has become more common for people in the AP world and AP US and AP European history is hip. So what the College Board essentially wants you to do with your document analysis is they want you to be able to describe how the source of the document, so that little thing in bold that comes before the document that in the past you probably just skipped over and ignored, they want you to look at that source of the document and explain how it's relevant to the information presented. Um, so what impact does it kind of have or how can we put it, use that source to kind of give us more information about what's in the document. The key here is that they are giving you clues in the source. It's like a detective game. Like they're not just randomly, they're not picking random sources. They're specifically putting things in that sourcing to give you insight or clues on how to analyze the document correctly. Um, and this is all kind of hypothetical right now until we get into some specifics. But there's four different ways to HIP. That's why each of these is an acronym, H-I-P-P. So there's four ways to do it. For when you do it for when you explain it with a document, you only need to pick one of those four. OK, and I'll come back to this at the end and remind you again when we're done um, to get the point on the rubric of the seven documents in the DBQ. You need to correctly give the document analysis for three of them. So you only need to do three of seven. Correct. I always say do it for every single document. Just try and do it for all seven, because if you do it for all seven, even if only three of the seven are correct, you still get the points. You just need to get three right. So if four of them are wrong and three of them are right, um, that's generally not good in most things in life. But for this, it's good because you only need three correct. So try and do it for every one, every document, every DBQ you write. I just think it makes so much more sense. So here's what they stand for. Here's the H. The H stands for historical context. This is different than contextualization. Um, but it is similar in that it is giving a little bit of background. So I'm going to give you a couple first. Let me explain this and then I'm going to show you an example of this. So this is something could be like what led to the creation of this document. So what happens right before this document was written that led to this creation of this document? Um, it could be, for example, the Declaration of Independence. So if it's an excerpt from Jefferson um, and the Declaration of Independence, you might say, for example, the Battle of Lexington and Concord had happened or um, the uh, periods right before it with the Boston Massacre or something that led right before Thomas Paine's Common Sense, something that led right before it. Or you could also mention what does this document lead to? So how is this document important? So the Declaration of Independence, for example, is going to lead to um, America declaring their independence and eventually a war of independence with Great Britain. You could also say what specific laws, policies, leaders are related to the document. Um, you could talk about the context of many founding fathers in the United or in the colonies being involved in the writing process of this document, although Jefferson gets his, is specifically seen as the person who leads this charge. But there are others involved in this process and discussing and debating these enlightenment ideas that come out in this. Um, this is not contextualization, which is usually about the previous time period in general leading into the question. This is about the context of the document specifically. I'm going to hop out of this presentation for a second and I'm going to hop into um, an example of this. So this is a propaganda poster. So here's our source at the bottom here. A propaganda poster created in 1942 during World War II by the Ministry of Information in Great Britain. So this is our source, right? So it gives us some clues here. We know it's 1942, which it's telling us here is during World War II. And we know that the Ministry of Information which we don't even necessarily need to know what it is, but we know that that is some type of government organization in Great Britain. And then lastly, we have it's a propaganda poster. And hopefully you remember that propaganda posters were used during wartime to either to usually try and convince people to join the war effort. So this is it. It says beat fire bomb Fritz. Um, you can tell it says Britain shall not burn. Britain's fire guard is Britain's defense. And you can see the Nazi swastika here coming down almost as a missile. And this is called Firebomb Fritz. Fritz was a common name in Germany. So we're kind of using some stereotypical uh, name here. And this is supposed to be, we need to make sure Britain doesn't burn and to beat Firebomb Fritz, we need to help 
fire guard Britain um, through our defense. So here's an example of historical context for this. Okay, I would say something like the propaganda poster, and in bold here is is the actual historical context created three years into World War II as fighting was at its worst. So this is created during. So I'm letting the reader know this is created during World War II when fighting was at its worst. That's the historical context. That's the time period that it was written. And I'm just saying it illustrates how government tried to mobilize all people to win the war. Um, so that's the description. That is the actual description of the document. So that's that one. Coming back, I find that historical context is generally the hardest for people um, just because you have to know what's going on at the time. And a lot of people aren't good with dates, but it works. The next one is the intended audience. This is who is the author speaking to? Who is it created for um, and why? You'll never say it was created for the people, all right? Don't say that ever. It's a horrible way of describing things. Don't be like, the propaganda poster was created for people, right? So if we come back to the propaganda poster example, and I'm going to keep jumping in and out of this, so hopefully it's not too annoying. Um, you're going to say, you would say something like, for his intended audience, the propaganda poster produced for the British population who may not have seen the Nazis as a threat to the country, illustrates how governments try to mobilize all people to win the war. So this right here in bold is our intended audience. It's the British population who the government is trying to, who may not have seen uh, Nazis as a threat to the country. That is who it is intended for. All right. Um, so coming back here, the next one <coughs> is purpose. So we have historical context, <coughs> excuse me, intended audience and purpose. The next one is why, what, or what was the reason the document was created? What is the purpose of the document? Examples of this could be a diary or a journal entry. So you have historic, like a, like a diary or journal entry is like a historical record. Someone maybe wants to keep a record. They might be a politician and they might want to keep things for posterity's sake. You might have a letter between two people and that letter, the purpose of that letter might be from, for example, um, the king of the Congo in the 1800s, writing a letter to the King of Belgium, who might be requesting that troops be removed or that um, the horrors that the Belgian soldiers are committing. That would be an example of a letter from one person to the other. And the, the purpose of it is to try and convince the leader of the perspective of the other person. It could also be a speech, um, which influences those listening. So generally, when someone gives a speech, they're trying to influence the people to convince them of their way. This is different from what the document says. The purpose of, we're looking at the source and how the person speaking, writing are, what the why they're creating the document, what's the reason they created the document. That's different from the details of what the document is saying. So coming back here, in terms of purpose, we're going back to our propaganda poster again, created during World War II, 1942 by the Ministry of Information. The purpose, the propaganda poster designed to create unity amongst the British population in the face of the Nazi threat. So the propaganda poster is attempting to create unity amongst the British people to fight against the Nazis, um, how the government's tried to mobilize and win the war. So that's the purpose. And then last but not least is the perspective of the author. Um, what is the position of the author and how might that impact what the author says? Um, this could be something like a female, and I put here a female living under, and it should be dot, 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 a female living under... Um, the we haven't talked about it yet but like a, an, after the iranian revolution or the female female living under uh the taliban government in afghanistan or a female living under um pre-french society before the french revolution so that's going to impact the perspective of the author um coming back here so the perspective of this is this propaganda poster, the propaganda poster created by the british government which sought to influence the public support of world war ii so i'm saying who created it and why that's important of what they're trying to do. They're trying to influence the public support of World War II. And that's our perspective of the author. Uh, per, the perspective could be um, a the president of the United States speaking to another leader is going to have an impact on what the president of the United States is saying because that person is the president of the United States. So this is all about the key here is you just need to mention historical context, intended audience, purpose, or perspective of the author. Only one of those for the document and what impact it has on the document. Um, 
I showed you examples there that are called a positive statements. Those are within the sentence. So they are, if you go back and look at what I just did, I just created things that show, I'll come back for you so you don't have to. These are within the sentence. So this is my, this is showing the stuff that's not bold in these sentences is showing how the document proves my topic sentence or proves my thesis. The bold here is my positive sentence or my positive statements. They are kind of within the sentence. That's one way of doing it. My suggestion for most of you, unless you're a really good writer, is to make the hip a standalone sentence and say something like, the historical context of this document is blah, 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 or the intended audience of the document is blah, blah, blah. And then that way you never forget it. It's clear to the reader what you're trying to do. Um, if that's not, if you are a really good writer, you can try the positive sentences. It just makes it less that you have to write, um, but it's up to you as long as it's in there and as long as it's clear to the reader. Last but not least, just to wrap up, and I just want to mention this one more time, you can pick, there's historical context, intended audience, purpose, or, or perspective of the author. You can pick any of those four for each document. For example, you can use historical context for document one, and then document two, explain purpose, and then document three, explain historical context, and document four, explain perspective of the author. You can go all around and jump around however you want to do. Hypothetically, you could do purpose for all seven documents. Most likely, the test is written, so you can't do the same skill for each one, but hypothetically, you could if it worked that way. Again, you only have to get three out of seven right. So if the other four are incorrect, but three are right, you're good. You get the point. Um, and then last, it's not, never tell me if the author is lying or if the person's biased. That's not what this is about. This isn't saying this propaganda poster is lying about the threat of the Nazis. That's not what this is, the purpose of doing this is. This is just trying to show that you understand that the source is impacting the writing, that the source is part of the message being put out here. The, I don't say that the person's biased, everyone's biased. That's a, just get that out of your vocabulary and get that out of your historical thinking skills. Um, it is how these different things impact the message, okay? So that's what I got. That's a 12 minute video on hipping and document analysis. Um, as always, write it down. Let me know if you got any questions. We're gonna do a lot of practice of this over the next couple months, but that's the basic gist of it. I'm out.